Welcome. Welcome to Centers for Spiritual Living Greater Las Vegas. My name is Reverend Claire Summerhill. I'm one of the staff ministers here who has the incredible privilege of serving you and of being on this path with you, this path of exploration, this path of growth, this path of learning and sharing and being in community. If you're here for the first time tonight, I want to extend a special welcome to you. We're honored that you've come to check us out and to see if maybe being part of a community like this is something that would make a difference in your life. I believe it would, and we would love to have you come and learn more about who we are and what we do. I want to welcome everybody who's watching us online, either right now or at any time. One of the amazing things about our technology today is the way we can be connected without any limitations of time or space. We always have many exciting things going on here. We are a center for spiritual living. As you came in, you received one of these that has some of the things that are coming up. Um, this Tuesday, we have next this coming Tuesday, we have a special thing. Every Tuesday morning, we have an ongoing gathering uh, that's called Adventures in Faith. There's not really any uh, curriculum, and you can come as you please. And it's a time to share and be supported. But this coming Tuesday, we're going to have a movie called The Shack. Bring some food. Come and share. Come and meet some people. Um, it's just a fun time to get together. It's um, at 10.30 uh, a.m. on Tuesday. Um, we also are having our volunteer day uh, coming up on August 23rd at the Boys and Girls Club. Every month, our center chooses one charity, one place that's doing some good work, and we donate part of uh, our what we tithe we donate to them to help support their work, and then we go and work there as well. And if anyone's been to these, they're incredible times. It's a fun time to get together, to be together, to make a difference, and to actually take action to make a difference in the world, and to work at creating a world that works for everyone, which we claim is our mission. That's what we're doing. We're working to create a world that works for everyone in all of creation. And this is a way that we can do that in a hands-on uh, practical sense. Uh, next Wednesday is A Million Acts of Kindness with our lovely Judy Petit and Bobby Williams, who are always an inspiration. I encourage you to come and be a part of that. The next Wednesday um, is our Tize, and um, Love is a Bright Idea. That's on August 30th. Um, if you haven't been to one of the Tize services, don't miss that. This is a sacred evening of music, prayer, candle lighting, sharing, um, and coming together in a unique kind of spiritual experience, uh, moving and inspiring, um, and always an incredible gift from everyone who participates. Um, on September 2nd, we're having our cleanup day. Again, a wonderful time to come and give of your time and your effort to keep the place where we come together um, beautiful. Um, and Sabrina always does an incredible job of having meaningful work for all of us to do. When you came in, you also received a connection card I encourage you all to fill this out and let us know that you're here tonight. If you're here for the first time, this is a way that we can start to be connected. Um, there's a place on the back for uh, a prayer request. Feel free to put something on there. You can put a name, someone that you feel needs some love, some support, some positive energy. Put your own name there and, and what you're seeking prayer for. These prayer cards, these connection cards, and these prayers are prayed over by our practitioners. Um, and it's all confidential. So you might consider that. So 
Our service tonight is titled, It's Summer and the Living is Easy. Now, summer's coming to a close, but I don't want the summer to fade away and for us to forget the gifts of summer. And here's what some of the gifts of summer are. Ease, effortlessness, fun, laughter. Just imagine, you know, imagine all of it. Sitting by the sparkling pool, walking on the beach, riding an inner tube down the lazy river, hiking the zip line. Those are the gifts of summer. And tonight, as we look at some overall ideas, we're going to remember that that summer place, we can have that any time. So we're going to start with a song that I invite you to, to join along with us. I'm choosing heaven today. Okay. I'm choosing heaven today I'm choosing heaven today I am walking the road of heaven right now Singing I'm choosing heaven today Let's choose love I'm choosing love today I'm choosing love today I am walking the road of heaven right now Singing I'm choosing love today. Let's choose some peace. I'm choosing peace today. I'm choosing peace today. I am walking the road of heaven right now. Singing, I'm choosing peace today. Back to heaven. I'm choosing heaven today. I'm choosing heaven today. I am walking the of heaven right now singing I'm choosing heaven today I am walking the road of heaven right now singing I'm choosing heaven today always heaven is a choice it's not a place it's not a goal to choice. Let's begin now by joining in prayer. Right here and right now, we come together in love, in community, knowing that we choose heaven. And as this service begins tonight, we make a declaration. I am ready to receive. I am ready to awaken. It's my intention to let my heart be free to hear, to remember, to feel the support, the energy of the universe. In this space of allowing, declaring, and inviting, we let it be and say together, and so it is. You know, we call it an invocation because it begins our service, but we might just as well call it an invitation or a declaration. And you might even think, you know, to do something like that at the beginning of each day, your own invocation, your own intention, your own declaration of what your day is going to hold. That's what choosing heaven means. We have that power. So, every Wednesday, uh, when it comes my turn, which is usually on the third Wednesday, 
I'd like to spend some time as I'm preparing thinking about who are we and what do we believe. And I do this for myself. I don't know about you, but, you know, I just have a hard time remembering sometimes <clears throat> the good that surrounds me, the love that enfolds me, the miracles that we live in, and I forget. So I like to take a few minutes and think about that. Who are we? Who are we as Centers for Spiritual Living? And this is who we are. We're an open, welcoming community. We honor all paths. This means that we recognize truth from all philosophies and faith traditions. And it means that we respect everyone who's on their own path as they go. We are a praying group. And we call our form of prayer spiritual mind treatment. It's based on the study of Dr. Ernest Holmes, who studied the wise sages, philosophers of, of over all time and came up with a practical, reproducible way to approach life. And he called his philosophy the science of mind. And we sometimes call ourselves religious scientists. What does that mean? Well, a religion is simply a community with a shared perspective on the nature of reality. That's what a religion is. A community with a shared perspective, and we have that. And we're scientists. Maybe you don't always think of yourself as scientists, but what's a scientist? A scientist is someone who's willing to do experiments. How does a scientist get information? They don't rely on what someone else tells them or believe it because somebody else said you should believe this. They observe. They watch. They come up with an idea. They test that idea. They see what happens. And that's what we do as scientists. And I look at myself and what I've learned through that process. And one of the things I've learned is that the universe is a positive, generous, supporting place. Many of the people who are scared, lonely, believe that the universe is at best neutral and at worst harmful, trying to hurt them, take advantage of them. Many people live in that world where people are ready to steal from them, use them. We have learned and I personally have learned through my own experiments and observations that that's not true, that the, the universe is positive, the universe is supportive. One of my favorite stories is the story of the prodigal son, which you may know, the boy who left, took his, his, his share of the father's wealth and squandered it, came to himself in the far country and thought, wait a minute, why am I out here starving? My father has enough and to spare. And he turned and went back and headed back. And the part of the story I love the most is that the father saw him from a far off coming. And the father rushed out to greet him. Now this was his son who'd kind of messed up. You know, taken the stuff, wasted it. The Father is the, represents the universe. That's how the universe is. All we have to do is just kind of turn our face toward truth, toward reality, toward abundance. And the universe can't stop itself from rushing out, rushing toward us. That's what we know. That's who we are. We have practitioners. And what do they practice? Practice knowing the truth. We'll have practitioners tonight after our service, and they're available after every service. And I encourage you, whether you're new, whether you've been coming for a long time, take advantage of that amazing gift of our practitioners. Let them know the truth for you. 
sometimes just asking for help and acknowledging that help is possible makes a powerful shift occur. And of course, if your life is fantastic, and all of us have those times when everything seems to just be flowing, that's also a time to pray with a practitioner because we know that what we bless increases. As we bless our abundance, we enjoy more abundance. As we bless the love in our lives, we have more love. As we bless the good, our good increases. So that's who we are. Perhaps some of you have heard me talk about the importance of balance. For me, this is kind of an ongoing theme, and it's the challenging balance between when is it time to relax, let go, go with the flow, trust, and when is it time to take action, set goals, work. They seem very different. Relaxing, just let it go, everything will work out, it'll all be good, and work, work, work. And of course, the challenge is bringing those together in a perfect balance. So recently, I shared one of my favorite sayings with a friend, and he suggested I might share it with you. And this is the saying to help us remember that balance. And it's this. Don't juggle, orchestrate. And what does that mean? Now, you know what juggling is? you got all these balls we're trying to keep in the air. Family and work and career and our house and this and like learning things and we're supposed to be reading and we're supposed to be doing this and we're trying to keep all these balls in the air and exercise and eat right and take time to relax. And, and what always happens when you're juggling? You start dropping the ball. And when a ball drops, you feel like you failed. You failed. The goal is to keep all these balls in the air, and you can't. And so pretty soon, you just don't even want to do it. Or you think, I'll just hold this one ball, and I'll make sure I don't drop it. And you're not doing any of the rest of it. If your life is juggling, if that's what you're doing, and you're trying to juggle all these balls, you always are going to have this sense of failing. So you shift it. Instead of juggling, orchestrate. Now, what does that mean? That means instead of juggling, you're the conductor. The orchestra is spread out there before you. And it's up to you to when the different parts come in. And sometimes they're all playing at once, and that's a beautiful sound. But sometimes it's time for the violin solo. Sweet, plaintive. Now, when the violin is having its solo, does that mean the trumpet has failed? Of course not. It's the time for the violin or the flute solo, the strings. What kind of symphony would it be if the cymbals were crashing through the whole thing? It wouldn't be much of a symphony, but they come in when they need to and at the perfect time. So if this is a quiet time in your life, when you're orchestrating, you're just enjoying the flute solo. But when it's time for the crashing and so on, you're bringing it all in. So if you ever get that feeling that you're juggling and you just can't keep all the balls in the air, you might think of that. Don't juggle. Orchestrate. So, how do you do it? How do you make it work? How do you make your life work? Well, that's why we have our spiritual practices. And tonight I want to talk about one of my favorite spiritual practices. I have two goals with it. One goal is to help you remember. And that's kind of in your mind. You know what I mean? You know these things. You know you're perfect, whole, and complete. You know you're an expression of the divine. You know you have gifts and talents to share. You know all that. 
You know the universe is ready to rush out when you even just turn your face in that direction. But we forget. So that's one goal. My other goal is that you actually have an experience. That's the heart. Where you actually have the experience of feeling connected, loved, inspired, a sense of possibility. So that's my goal as well. So we call our form of prayer spiritual mind treatment or affirmative prayer. Now, why do we call it spiritual mind treatment? Because we are not treating conditions. We're not trying to make somebody's disease go away. We're not trying to get somebody a job, get uh, somebody to have more friends, for a relationship to start working, for somebody's boss to be nicer. We're not treating that. Treating our minds. We're changing our minds about it. So we're treating our minds, that's why it's called spiritual mind treatment, because we know that our thoughts control our circumstances. And that as our thinking changes, our circumstances actually change. Jesus, that great mystic, said, it will be done unto you even as you believe. And another great mystic, Dr. Wayne Dyer, said, you'll see it when you believe it. So that's why it's called spiritual mind treatment. Now, we also call it affirmative prayer. And you know why we call it that? So affirmative means yes. So some of us were taught as children and some other denominations engage in what I call negative prayer because basically they're saying no. No to what they have. I don't like what I have. Give me something different. I don't like my job. I don't like my health. I don't like my wife. No, no, no. That's negative prayer. No, give me something else. Our form of affirmative prayer, we say yes. Yes. Yes to what we're willing to accept. Yes. So I sometimes think that some of us are like a little child who wakes up in the morning and goes to her mom and says, Mommy, should I wear my Hello Kitty socks today? And what does the mom say? Oh, that's a great idea. Sure. The mother knows it doesn't matter. The kid's going to have a great day, fun, adventures. But then we go ask, should I take this job? Should I marry this person? Should I move here? Should I take, should I do this? Should I do that? And guess what the universe says? Well, sure. It's a great idea. Go for it. See, the universe doesn't care. The universe knows that whatever we do, it's going to be great. It doesn't matter any more than whether we wear our Hello Kitty socks or not. But oh my gosh, we put all that meaning in it. Saying that's so important. All right, so how do you do it? So I'm going to give you some of my ideas. But what's worked for me is I've done my own experiments. So the first thing is to be willing to ask. Now that may seem like a simple thing, but sometimes that is the hardest part of it. That's walking through the door of the prayer room and saying, I need some help. I was telling Lottie on the way over here, I have a grandson who's almost two, who's just my delight. Oh my gosh, like what could be better than that? Well, for the last six months, or so, you know, he's, they start that whining thing. When they can't get something they want or make something work, because oh, they can't talk, they don't have many words, you know what I mean? So every time he did that, I've said, say, help me, please. That's my response, say, help me, please, and then I help him. So yesterday, he was trying to reach his, his Elmo stuffed doll on the windowsill, and he couldn't get it, and he reached up there, and he said, hup, hup. So that's where we need to be, like not be afraid to, to ask that. I want to read you something. Um, this is from um, 
a book that a wonderful friend just gave me, Mark Nepo's The Book of Awakening. I think Laura mentioned it last week. And this was the um, reading, part of the reading for yesterday. It starts out with a quote, perhaps the shortest and most powerful prayer in human language is help. A hardness we can't see, cold and rigid, begins to form between us and the world the longer we stay silent about what we need. It is not even about getting what we need, but about admitting, mostly to ourselves, that we do have needs. Asking for help, whether we get it or not, breaks the hardness that builds in the world. Paradoxically, asking even for the things that no one can give, we are relieved and blessed for the asking. For admitting our humanness lets the soul break surface the way a dolphin leaps for the sun. So as you consider your lives and prayer, the first thing is to be willing to ask for help. Now the second part that I see, I call it identifying the condition. Now the condition is what's come to your mind that you've noticed. And some of you may have heard my analogy of the check engine light. So you're driving in your car and the check engine light flashes on and it comes on. Okay, now, what if I go to the mechanic and I say, um, you know, that check engine light is really stressing me out, like to see that. Could you put some duct tape over that so I wouldn't see it, have to see it and be stressed? Now, it's silly, isn't it? Let's see, what we forget is that stuff that shows up in our life, that's all it is. An illness, a relationship challenge, job, money, just everything that shows up in our life, that's all it is. It's a check engine light coming on, telling us, hey, pay attention, Something's going, something is going on here. The check engine light is not a bad thing. It's a useful thing. And everything that happens is a gift for our awakening. We want to awaken. So identifying the condition helps us to see, oh, there's something that I need to notice there. We don't judge it. We don't make it wrong. It's just like, oh. Well, that's interesting. I wonder what's going on with that. Now, Laura, last week, if you were here, gave one of the most beautiful explanations that I have heard about the difference between accepting and acknowledging. So we don't have to accept what we notice, like saying, well, whatever, there's nothing I can do about it. That's the way things are, never mind, blah, blah, blah. That's resignation. Acknowledging means that's what's so. That's all. That's what showed up. So it's sometimes this identifying the condition part is one of the most challenging parts for me in prayer. I, I've recently been sort of dealing with a, a bout of depression, and I deal with these from time to time, and they come, and then I do what I do, and, and then it passes. And, but, you know, it's something I deal with. And I was talking to Reverend Doug about it, which, you know, I suggest is a wonderful practice for anybody. Talk to a minister, talk to somebody when you're dealing with something. And he said, you know, I love Reverend Doug, and one of the things I love about him is everything's pretty simple for him. You know, I have a tendency to, wow, I just make stuff so complicated. And he goes, well, the depression's the condition, isn't it? Like you, just, you want that to go away, right? And I said, well, maybe not. See, it's hard to tell for sure what the condition is. Maybe the condition is um, I'm not using my gifts and talents. I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm playing too small, and it's making me sad. Like maybe that's the condition. So you always have to sort of look, look for that. One of the things you work with with a practitioner, sometimes a practitioner will help you. You know, as you're talking to them and they'll go, well, it sounds like such and such. And you go, oh, you know, you'll see like, well, that's what it is. So the condition. 
identifying the condition. All right, now what? So the first thing I suggest, now this is what Ernest Holmes taught as a way to do experiments. And you can think of these, I'm going to talk about five. You can think about them as aspects of prayer or ways to pray or kind of parts of prayer because we're always kind of in one or another of these and it doesn't matter which one comes first. So I'm just going to talk about them in order. The first one I call, be still. Now often when we join together in meditation, it's for this be still part. To just stop all our busy, busy monkey mind thoughts and everything and be still. Now in this stillness, we need to focus on one important thing. And that is the nature of reality. Now, in this first part, this, I'm kind of calling it the first part, we're not thinking about our problem. We're not thinking about how to solve our problem. You know, let's say it's a money problem. You know, our thoughts are here, here, here. Well, I better get a job. I should do this. I could ask blah, 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 blah. No, we're not going there. We're thinking about the nature of reality in the stillness, focusing on the nature of reality. Now, we might think about the condition. So let's say the condition is an experience of lack of some kind. A lot of us deal with that, it seems like. We have our experiences of lack, whether it's money or we don't have enough friends or we don't have enough time or we don't have enough energy. But let's say we're experiencing a sense of lack. So as we focus on reality, we focus on the reality around abundance. We're not thinking about our problem. We're not thinking about our condition. We're not thinking about how to solve that. We're simply focusing on the nature of reality. Let's think, think about trees. Think about an apple seed. See you how know, small they are? It grows into a tree that produces hundreds, I mean, maybe thousands of apples, and every one of those has more seeds, and that one little seed becomes an orchard. That's reality. Think about reality, about caterpillars changing into butterflies. Think about if, if your condition is that you're feeling separate and lonely, think about the interconnectedness of reality. Think about food. Think about the food coming from growing through all the process, to the grocery store, to my refrigerator, to me. Like, think of how interconnected everything is. The gas in my gas tank that got me here. The interconnected systems, how complicated they are. That's reality. You know, if your condition has something to do with health, think about the miracle of the human body. Like, even as we kind of abuse them, don't feed them very well, don't move them enough, don't take very good care of them, and look at how they do. Healing a wound, healing a broken bone. It's just reality. We don't have to do anything. I don't have to think. Like, oh, i got to work hard to make sure this food gets digested and this stuff I ate gets turned into blood and bones and stuff. So that's the first part, is just to be with reality. Not thinking about your problem, your issue. What is reality? Again, sometimes that part of it takes me a while to get to. You know, I'm kind of stuck in my stuff. Sometimes you have to stay there for a while. Again, when we come together in meditation, or when you meditate alone, that may be part of what you do. It's just be present. Reality. When you get that, you've got that sense of reality, then we move to what I call the, the next step, and I call it no. So you can kind of remember that. Be still and no. And what is it you need to know? Now, this is going to be tough to swallow, I know, but 
Here it is. Reality applies to you. You are not an exception to reality. Reality isn't out here, abundant, all that, everywhere else, and then you're over here. Like, reality applies to you. You can't make it not apply to you. You know, reality is gravity. It's not like you have to worry when you wake up if gravity is going to be working today. Any more than you have to worry about any of these other laws. The law of abundance, the law of circulation. How our bodies work. It, reality applies to you. You're part of reality. You can't say, well, that works for other people, that doesn't work for me. No, the seeds are there. Again, it may take you a while to get there. But when you get there, to that place of knowing what reality is, how reality works, and know that that applies to you. You're not an exception. Then you're ready for what I call the third step or aspect. And we might call it trust and act. Now, when you're in that space, when you get to that space, being present to how reality really works, and knowing that it applies to you, often what happens is ideas start to come. Now, and you can trust those ideas if they come from that space. Now, too often our ideas come from desperation, from survival, from fear. We're so wrapped up in our condition and so thinking, I gotta do something, I gotta do something, I can't stand this anymore, something's gotta change, that the ideas that come are limited. When we come from knowing reality, you know, and you know, I prefer the word reality, but some people like the word God and use that as a word of knowing that God is all there is, that we live in love, that we're surrounded by love. When we know that, and when we know that that applies to us, then ideas start to come and we can trust those ideas. And it's easy then to take action. And often we have to keep coming back. Ideas come, the universe is, is flooding us all the time with ideas. Do this, do this. In that space we can trust our intuition. We can trust the ideas that come. And, and I'm sure many of you have had this experience. You know, an idea comes and it just seems so out there. It's just out of the blue and your first thought is, oh, oh, oh that's crazy. But then you're in that space. And well, that space of like, what, what if you knew you couldn't fail? What if you think, well, whatever. I'll wear the Hello Kitty socks. Here I go. And then look what happens. Things unfold beyond what you could, could even imagine. Now see, a lot of times people get really focused on that act piece, that trust and act piece. It's just one small part of it really. Not that it's easy, but the fact is getting in touch with reality and knowing re how reality works and that it applies to you is really, for me anyway, a lot more of a challenge. I have plenty of ideas, but too often they come from fear, from survival, from desperation, trying to protect myself. I did that, what will happen, all that stuff. I want to share a little story with you that sort of illustrates 
what I'm talking about. A nurse took the tired, anxious serviceman to the bedside. Your son is here, she said to the old man. She had to repeat the words several times before the patient's eyes opened. Heavily sedated because of the pain of his heart attack, he dimly saw the young uniformed Marine standing outside the oxygen tent. He reached out his hand. The Marine wrapped his toughened fingers around the old man's limp ones, squeezing a message of love and encouragement. The nurse brought a chair so that the Marine could sit beside the bed. All through the night, the young Marine sat there in the poorly lighted ward, holding the old man's hand and offering him words of love and strength. Occasionally, the nurse suggested that the Marine move away and rest a while. He refused. Whenever the nurse came into the ward, the Marine was oblivious of her and of the night noises of the hospital, the clanking of the equipment, the laughter of the night staff members exchanging greetings, the moans of the other patients. Now and then she heard him say a few gentle words. The dying man said nothing, only held tightly to his son all through the long night. Along toward dawn, the old man died. The Marine released the now lifeless hand he had been holding and went to tell the nurse. While she did what she had to do, he waited. Finally, she returned. She started to offer words of sympathy, but the Marine interrupted her. Who is that man? he asked. The nurse was startled. Your father, she said. No, he wasn't, the Marine replied. I, actually, I've never seen him before in my life. Well, then why didn't you say something when I took you to him? I knew right away there'd been a mistake. But I also knew he needed his son, and his son just wasn't here. When I realized that he was too sick to tell whether or not I was his son, knowing how much he needed me, I stayed. So the Marine shows up, there's a condition. Man is dying. He could have said, that's not my father. I don't know anything about it. But instead, he was still. He was still, he knew the reality that we're all connected, that love is all there is. That each one of us can make a difference. He knew that reality. And he knew that that reality applied to him, that he was connected. And then from that place of knowing that, he trusted the urge that came. Sit here. Be here. That's an example of how those first three steps work. The fourth part or aspect of affirmative prayer is saying thank you. Some wise people have said that perhaps saying thank you is the only prayer we need. There are many things to give thanks for. We can give thanks for our ability to ask for help. For some of us, getting there is a huge step forward. Those of us who just spent so long trying to tough it out on our, by ourselves and prove we don't need anybody and we can do it by ourselves. That's a huge thing to be able to say thank you for. To be able to be thankful that we have practitioners here 
that we have each other, that we have ministers to help us. We can be thankful for the condition that showed up. Our gift from the universe for our awakening, helping us notice something's going on. We can give thanks for that. Of course, we can give thanks that reality is the way it is, that we do live in a positive, supportive universe. And we can give thanks for the ideas that come. We can give thanks for our ability to act. And we can always give thanks for the good that we know is coming. The Father who can't stop himself from rushing out to his returning son. The universe who can't stop itself from rushing to shower us with good, to unfold us, to hold us. We can always give thanks for that. We'll certainly give thanks for our community here, that we're not alone, that we have each other, we care about each other. I often give thanks for you, the way you guys support me on my path. You listen, you care. I can be tough to help sometimes, because I'm really stuck in that place of trying to do it all on my own and thinking I can do it. And give thanks for that. Now, being thankful might be the very first part of your prayers. You might start there. Perhaps some of you have kept a gratitude journal where for a certain amount of time, every day you simply write down a few things that you're thankful for. And it's an amazing practice. Pretty soon, you, all through the day, you're noticing things you're grateful for. And that may be the way you start your prayer time, your affirmative prayer. Yes, I'm thankful. That may help get you in the space. And then finally, to let it go. Our story about the Marine you know that as he left, he wasn't holding on to like, oh, why did they drag me out here? It wasn't even my father. I had other things to do. No. He let it go. Part of reality, of course, is that a seed has to grow. That's the nature of a seed. But you have to release it. You have to put it in that fertile soil. And you have to let it have the space to expand and unfold. So the releasing part sometimes is also might be the first part of your prayer. You might look at what do I need to let go of to move ahead in my life? To join, to accept. And that may be something that you go through in that process. I need to let go of this. I need to let go of that. So those are the five aspects of affirmative prayer. A powerful practice. And I encourage you to try one or more of them. Being still, being still and being present to the nature of reality, the abundance of reality, the vibrancy the incredible consistency and reliability and count on ability, reality, and know that it applies to you. You're right there in it. And when you get there, trust the ideas that come, give thanks, and then let it go. Thank you all for sharing my journey with me, for being here, for being part of our community, for making a difference, for seeking, for searching, for looking, for learning, for your willingness to step forward. I love you all for that. Namaste. Now, we come.
come to that wonderful time in our service where we get to remember the law of circulation of giving and receiving. We are, have been doing an incredible thing this past month here at our center, which is the month of special giving. This has been an inspiring thing for me, and I want to invite the president of our leadership council, Barb Schweppe, up to share with us about the month of special giving. Hi, everybody. Okay, well, it has been quite a month, and today is the last day. So if you haven't had a chance to be a part of this big event, it really has been fabulous. Uh, if you're not aware of it, I, I donated some money 30 days ago and, and asked the center to match the funds, and we have matched it, and we've gone above it. So it's been a really, really rewarding experience. And uh, today's the last day. There's an envelope in your seat pocket in front of you, and it's specifically for the month of special giving. If you want to be a part of the event, today's the day to, to, to put a little bit of money in the envelope and send it on its merry way. And to end it off, though, I wanna, wanted to talk to you about something that hopefully everybody got one of these when you, know, I, you walked in the door tonight. And uh, it's kind of like my little Ernest Holmes bucks here. Uh, the second week of when I did the uh, presentation for the month of special giving, I got up here and kind of was a little crazy, and I was talking about all the different things that I loved about the Center for Spiritual Living. And the list of them is on the back of this little book. Now, it turns out that this list, remarkably, I didn't realize it till I was looking at, because I am on the leadership council, I was looking at our income and expense statement, and it ended up that most of the things that are on that list are on the income and expense statement as expenses. They've all got an account number, and they all cost money. And the month of special giving was to kind of fill a, fill a gap that we had, but you know we, we need to give every week. We need to give every month. And so I, I, I made this up so that you would look at it and say maybe it's time for you to question whether your $5 weekly donation might go up to 10 or maybe your $10 one might go to 20 or above. Who knows? But then I also I, I wanted to honor Ernest, Ernest Holmes, our founder. I think it's real important to remember you know, how we started. Uh, the quote there, I, like all others, am seeking the joy of living. That's uh, from the first line of, the, of his book, This Thing Called You, uh, except I put it in first person. Uh, the symbol on the left, the V, of course, is uh, it's, it's a CSL symbol that helps us to visualize uh, a process by which the spirit descends into form. Um, the I am on the other side reminds us of the oneness of all of us. And then, of course, at the bottom, uh, the kingdom of God is within me. That was, it was a real wake-up call for me when I finally realized it. And I just felt that it needed to be on the bottom there because it, it means so much to me. And I know that anybody who, who is aware of that, it means a lot to you too. So, but I'm, I'm hoping that you'll look at this buck, maybe stick it in your wallet, put it on your bathroom mirror. Uh, you know, put it somewhere where you can think about your giving for the rest of the year. This month was great, but now it's time to also think as we move forward the needs of the center, the place that spiritually feeds you. So, and you can also use this green card and auto tithe if you want. So I'm going to end it off with the song that I've been singing, and I'm going to sing it for the last time. My God within said, let my big heart out, chase away those fears, time to stand up and shout. It was the month of special giving. You all turned your wallets out. Your love was what it was all about. Thank you. Our leaders are one of our gifts. So I invite our ushers to come forward and might put your gift on your heart or if you give uh, on Sunday or automatically, you might put your connection card there and say with me, I am so blessed. I give and receive freely knowing all is well. I am 
so blessed. I am so blessed. I am so grateful for all that I am. I am so blessed. I am so blessed. I am so grateful. I am so blessed. I am so blessed. I am so blessed. I am so grateful for all that I am. I am so blessed. I am so blessed. I am so grateful. I am so blessed. We are blessed. All right, let's all stand and join hands and sing together. Yes, there is peace on earth. there be peace on earth and let it begin with me let there be peace on earth the peace that was meant to be with God as our power loved ones all are we let us walk with each other in perfect harmony let peace begin with me let this be the moment now with step I take let this be my joyous vow to take each moment and live each moment in peace eternally let there be peace on earth and let it be Yeah. Thank you all.